Welcome to Page to Screen, the podcast where Nikki and Christina discuss books that were turned into movies and films that were adapted from books. As always, we do remind you that spoilers lay ahead. Now we invite you to decide with us the age-old question, which is better, the book or the movie? <laughs> happy one year, Christina. Yay, happy one. I cannot believe we made it. I know. It's so Looks good. Like we made it. Um, <laughs> I, I cannot believe we've been doing this for a whole year. A whole year. What mm-hmm. really started as an excuse to read Little Women <laughs> has turned into probably the best. The, it's one of the best things that come out of COVID. Well, you said that you wanted to have a two-person book club, yep. and here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Just us. <laughs> um, this has really been like a whirlwind, and I can't believe we went from I'm a Marmy to... <laughs> Where we are today. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who's listened over the year. Um, it's been like really great. Apparently, we're big in Japan, so um, hey, hello, yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us. Yeah, welcome. Um, this <laughs> to celebrate. <laughs> I don't think that, I mean, a lot of podcasts don't make it a year. We yeah. uh, we took planned breaks because we did um, make it clear that we were doing two books a month and we have, we've done it. We haven't yeah. missed one. I mean, that's a big one. It, well, we will miss, every podcast misses at some point, but we made it a year without that and that's pretty good, I think. Yeah. And, and like no repeats, no. Yeah. This is like, hey, we're, we're really doing it. <laughs> And how, how much is it? it what, 25 or 26? This, this is, is our 26. 25th. Oh, 25th. Okay. This so. is our 25th. This is like our Disney 25th anniversary right here. <laughs> but how many books? How, how, that's 25 books and how, how much time is spent watching the movies? That's a decent amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. And some of these books are actually really hard to read. Not this one. No. <laughs> no. This one, um, <laughs> This one was a joke that I took and ran with. Um, <laughs> I'll have you know, right now we are both dressed up for the occasion. Uh, <laughs> um, we are celebrating this monumentous occasion. The only way we know how with a musical. <laughs> so thank you, Andrew Lloyd Webber. Uh, we, I can't believe we did this. We're wearing cat ears right now, everybody. I just need everyone to know that. I I look like a cat right meow. <laughs> <sighs> Not all of our jokes land, but the cat ones do. Yeah. <laughs> they always land on their feet. Um, we are... Uh, so for those who didn't listen to our Emma episode and have no idea what we're talking about right now, um, we read Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats. <laughs> we did. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did read Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, uh, which is uh, something that T.S. Eliot didn't really write. He made just poems and they accidentally became a book in the mid to late 1930s and um t.s Eliot is a well-known poet um he's mostly well known for quite serious things and in the background he was writing this book of practical cats because he was a big cat guy and somehow his entire career has eroded down to this one nuanced thing that he did for his friends and it got published and i it all kind of fell into uh, an out of control abyss where we find ourselves today. <laughs> I mean, that's one way of putting it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we've been doing this for a year. We know what we're talking about. Um, yeah, this. The I... funny thing. The funny thing about 
about this. Okay, yes. is T.S. Eliot writes serious stuff. The dude won a Nobel Prize. He's got what in the wasteland. All of this like serious stuff, well known. And he inspires all these other people, and he is actually quite, like, talented when it comes to poetry. And think about that. Like, think about, I don't know, uh, so- someone who's really great. Like, you've got, oh, let's just say Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg has all these things in his giant career, and in a hundred years, the only thing that they talk about is Ready Player One. Oh, how God. does that happen? Like, how how does your your footprint on this world turn into cats? Because of Andrew Lloyd Webber. Thanks. Andrew Lloyd Webber is still alive. That's why we have cats as cats. <laughs> um, I... Listen, I... <laughs> I like cats. Yeah. <laughs> And this is going to be my you. therapy. This is going to be my therapy today. Um, I now, love that you like cats. Thank you. I I love the poems in this book. I actually do too. I had never read them before um, you know, needed to for this podcast. And I actually found them to be quite fun. Yeah, they are definitely like, if I'm trying to get, if I were trying to get a kid into poetry. Yes. This would be the book. Mm -hmm. Because it is just, every poem is fun. And then on top of that, like uh, in Brooklyn, we have a lot of um, feral cats. And there's a whole uh, group of people who take care of them. So they have these little cat houses (laughs) out by the waterfront. Super adorable, by the way. If you ever come to Brooklyn and run my running path you'll see them so I see cats all the time and I'm like ah you're such a rum tum tugger ah you're an old Deuteronomy <laughs> I love I my my family is a very big cat family I mean I have a dog now uh and they have dogs now but we've growing up we always had cats um I feel a strong connection to the felines <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> they just do what they want. I want to be a cat. Um, but I, the poetry is just really fun. And mm-hmm. it's, I don't know, it's definitely a book. I feel like this is definitely the most childish book we've done in the entire year. Yeah. Like, we, yeah, I know we did Little Women, and that's usually geared towards a younger set of women. But, this is for like little kids. Like yeah. you could read this to a kid before they're even really reading. Like I would say little women. In fact, when I think about me growing up, my mom definitely gave me a lot of poetry books and I grew up super into like Shel Silverstein and stuff yeah. like that. Um I definitely can see this being given to like a little kid, but maybe not where they're reading like full chapter books yet. Like this is a stepping stone to that. Yeah, this is definitely like a poem a night kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And it's the imagery. He's T.S. Eliot's so good with words. Mm -hmm. Because you, like, you're reading it and you close your eyes. Like, that's why it was made into a musical, you know? It is, Yeah. it's flowy and it's, you can see it as you're, it's so good. And so much of it was actually kept in like yeah. the, the lyrics are heavily sourced from the poems you start reading the poems and then it's like rum tum tugger like it just goes into the yeah. song where when I'm reading it I start hearing the song as I'm reading the poem Same. yeah there are a couple that are not did not translate to the stage show mm-hmm. um which I think is a I understand why I, I mean, it would drag it down a little bit. Like, you don't have Growl Tiger's Last Stand. Mm-hmm. Um, and in my copy of the book, Christine and I were talking about this before we started recording, I have Cat Morgan introduces himself, and it's about a pirate cat, which I think was a real disservice that that was not included in the Broadway <laughs> musical because I read it like it was a sea shanty, and I was like, <laughs> everyone needs to hear this. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Weber. Oh, sir. He's a lord, isn't he? Yes. Lord Weber. Yeah. Andrew, <laughs> can you get on this real quick? I need a pirate cat ASAP. If um, I hear that someone is named Lord Weber, it better be a spider. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that Charlotte's husband? 
<laughs> Lord and Lady Weber. Andy Weber. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite poem from the book? Um, not really. Not really. I, I feel like if I were a kid, I probably would. I'd probably actually like, um, I think this is the very first one, the um, Annie Dots one, but this time around, not really. No. Oh, the Gumby Cat? Gumby Cat, yeah. Yeah. I've always loved Rum Tum Tugger. Yeah. And I think I love Rum Tum Tugger because if you read that poem or if you listen to the song from the musical, not from the... 2019 movie which we will be discussing later if you listen to it from the actual stage show um it's it's every cat yeah every cat's a dick (laughs) (laughs) let's get real you'll look at a cat and it'll just go meow and you're like what do you want it's like meow no what do you what do you need do you want to go in do you want to go out you put it inside of a room where it's been scratching at the door and then two seconds later it's like i don't like it in here yeah (laughs) i thought i would but i hate it Every See, cat's to, like that. To be clear, I am not a cat person. Uh, to, to start, I am allergic to cats. And I'm very, very allergic to cats. So I I have to take allergy medicine if I'm going to be around cats. Even if I'm not going to be around cats, my body still knows. Like if I pet a dog and then I just start sneezing and then I find out that the dog has a little kitty sister, it's because the cat hair is on the dog. Like, I'm very allergic. And I just remember growing up with dogs, and when I was maybe, like, three or four, I remember my first encounter, long encounter, with a cat, and I was petting it, and everything was going fine, and then it just, like, like, it hissed, and then it, like, dug its claws into my arm, and I started bleeding and screaming, and they're like, it's okay, it's just a cat. I'm like, why the do you have this? Like, what is the meaning of this? I just don't understand the appeal with cats when one of the best things that you can say about a cat is, oh, don't worry, they're just like a dog. <laughs> what? Um, what are we doing here? Cats are the first weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> <laughs> cats, cats are... I believe you mean weapons of mouse destruction. <laughs> <laughs> or meow destruction. Um, <laughs> cats are are not nice. I w- I will say that cats aren't nice, but cats are like um, you, you know, like I feel like if a cat were a human, it'd be like your that cool older cousin that you always wanted to be like, and they're just like, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, mm-mm-mm. like we're not doing that. And you're like, oh, okay, okay, cool. Let's just let me know when you want me right here because cats have this tendency to just be like i hate you i hate you i hate you and then the minute you are busy the minute you are doing anything they're like hi (laughs) remember me your fun roommate it's like ah yeah (laughs) see i i and you know when i say i'm not exactly a cat person i feel like whenever i say that to cat people a lot of times they get all up in arms about it but cat people definitely look down at dog people because i am for sure a dog person even in this stack of poetry there's a whole bit talking shit about dogs so it's like oh you talk about the peaks and the pollicles yes yeah don't dish it if you can't serve it wait don't (laughs) don't dish it if you can't take it there you go thank you (laughs) Don't dish it if you can't serve it. Um, I think yes. they dished it and served it. I just don't think they want to eat it afterwards. He he talks a lot of shit about yeah. dogs, which I took as an offense. And at one part, he says, just chuck him underneath the chin or slap his back or shake his paw and he will gamble and guffaw. He's such an easygoing lout. He'll answer any hail or shout. Okay, buddy, try that with Grayson. You slap Grayson on the back or shake his paw. You just yell at him. Grayson's going to look at you like, who the fuck do you think you are? And Grayson is my shih tzu dog, everybody, just so you know. Um, Zuzu, who is my mixed breed dog, um, loves a good paw shake. (laughs) She really does. Uh, Because she knows she's getting a treat. Uh, That's why. Um, No, I agree. Like, he does... T.S. Eliot does say a lot of mean stuff about dogs. And I mean, even at the end, when they're doing the um, the readdressing of the cat's poem, and mm-hmm. he's like, I have to, he's like, um, don't forget, I have to remind you, a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat. <laughs> and it's like, right. 
duh. <laughs> I mean, hi. I'm in my 30s. I think I know what the two animals look like. But um, <laughs> um, I was surprised with the poems how, like, one of the smartest parts was the whole bit with the McCavity cat. Yeah. And it never struck me that McCavity is supposed to be, like, Moriarty from Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. That's so intelligent. I love that. Yeah, it's, it's, it really plays, I think that all of these cats are really just reflections of, like, British culture. Yeah. Back at when the, the poems were first being written. There were some problematic aspects for me. Did you Do tell. catch? <laughs> <laughs> well, th- so there is one cat who like fights other cats down at the dock. And uh, what's his name? Growl, Growl Tiger. Growl, Growl Tiger. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes down to the docks and he fights people there and he particularly doesn't like foreigners Mm -hmm. and then there's like a couple lines about possibly the Chinese and I was like ooh, yeah what's going on here and then once I finished everything because it doesn't take long to read it only takes like maybe 10-15 minutes that like tops um it well maybe not that I don't know how long did it take you to read it to read this book I've read it multiple times it doesn't take very long like it is definitely maybe Maybe I would say estimate about an hour to read these because you're going to want to read them and not sing them, <laughs> <laughs> which was my problem. Well, my problem always with this is that it probably only takes 10 to 15 minutes to like read in total, but I'm taking notes and looking stuff yeah. up. So yeah, it's probably more like an hour in total, but um he is fighting all these people, and it sounds like he's fighting the Chinese. And then I like put a pause on it, and I look it up, and find out that T.S. Eliot is like racist. Yep. <laughs> yep. I was waiting for this one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole book title, the Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, he was named Old Possum, which is actually like an in joke, and it is a reference back to the um. Uh, it's the Uncle Remus works, which is the whole Song of the South thing, and it's a joke, and it's a a racist joke, and it's, like, really bad. And so there's, like, a lot of that in these poems, which is a a real shame, because, like I said, I actually think they're pretty fun, and if I had a kid, I would consider buying this book for them to read, and it's just like, well, there's that problem to it. It's almost like some you know mark twain stuff like ugh. yeah i don't want to i don't believe in censorship i don't think it should be censored but at the same time it's just a shame that that is an umbrella over this yeah i would say that um growl tiger is probably the most blatant and probably the one you could skip over yeah in the whole yeah. book um because yeah he talks uh in the in the poem um it's but but most to cats of foreign race his hatred had been vowed to cats of foreign name and race no quarter was allowed so um <laughs> yeah but even later when he's talking about the dogs he refused he oh the re- pe- yeah yeah he refers to one of them as like the huffery snuffery heathen chinese it's just like oh ay, ay, yeah. ay. oh no yeah not so good. Um, but I will say that um, I think one of the sweetest ones, the one that makes me cry the most, because I, like, for anyone who hasn't read the book, Grizabelle is not, a, a, there is no memory poem in the book <laughs> that's just for the musical. But, though, it's funny, everyone cries in the musical when they when Grizabella sings Memory. Um, I know this from personal experience, um, which we'll get into later. Um, but Gus the Theater Cat yeah. <laughs> always made me severely depressed. <laughs> oh <Aww>, no. <laughs> well, when I was growing up, I had the 1998 VHS tape of the stage show of Cats. 
And the actor they have in that is is an older man who plays him like it's like it's written in the in the poem where mm-hmm. he talks about like he's like um you know he's he's not how he used to be you know all that stuff and he's like shaking as he's as he's doing it and mm-hmm. just like oh my god such a good performance if you guys get that 1998 VHS out just fast forward to that and get your tissues it's beautiful um <laughs> I love it. Uh, but that's one of the ones that I, I always like uh, to read, and it just makes me sad. I just wanted to yeah. share that with everyone. <laughs> well, like, the one thing that's really surprising with the poems, because I wasn't too sure if it was just going to be a bunch of nonsense or if it had more of a story to it, and then the answer is, like, a little bit of both, but yeah. it kind of works because each poem is fairly short, and the characters are so well thought out that you immediately know the character of the cat without like any question and that's where taking the poems and turning them into songs I think could be successful because it's you just know it and it's that weird thing where me not a cat person I've never owned a cat I immediately know what cat they're talking about (laughs) yeah you can see it yeah you can see it and yeah like you said earlier it's like the visuals to it are pretty strong and then yeah like the little theater cat it's there is like an emotion to it yeah especially when you read the part where he's like he suffers from palsy so his paws always shake i oh god i'm in my feelings listen over the last year i've cried a lot on this podcast (laughs) and i'm not going to do it today you're not getting me cats but so we're not going to talk about gus anymore but yeah that's like you read that and you you immediately know that cat about like with all of them i mean i guess growl tiger for me is one of the ones where i'm like maybe he's a fisher cat because those Mm -hmm. cats are are awful and i don't even think they're technically really cats they're in the genus whatever we're not gonna get into it they're fish (laughs) (laughs) don't be stupid nikki oh my god i'm so dumb sorry (laughs) (laughs) wait a minute minute, real quick you want to know my dumb moment of the day (laughs) i would love to please do okay so i was i was reading this and it's it's what (laughs) it's when um he says uh that all cats have three names. Yeah. And I'm like, ah, what would my name, my three names be? Oh, wait a minute. I already have three names. <laughs> <laughs> but would you, do you have like a, a cat Nikki name? I don't, you know, I don't because uh, just like the cats in the poem, they're constantly in thought of their name. What about Nikki Bell? No, it has to be no. a name that's particular and more dignified. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> we should, you know, we should definitely take a quiz. We should take a quiz before the end of the podcast is over and find out what our our cat's names is. See, my, mine could be like, well, her name was Christina, but they called her yeah. Stina. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, what? I'm going to Google. I'm going to Google one right now. Cat name generator. <laughs> I did die though. You were talking about the theater cat Gus. Yeah. So Gus is not his name. His real name is Asparagus. Yeah. And when I read that his real name is Asparagus, I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> He's probably stinky. But as I ought to have told you before, his name is Asparagus. Shut up. Imagine just coming over to my house. Hey, what's up? Oh, you got a cat. Yeah. What's his name? Asparagus. <laughs> this is my cat, Asparagus. <laughs> uh, asparagus, he's got to get his shots today. <laughs> Wait, Christina, I'm, I found one of those ones where it's, uh, what's your cat name? What's the first letter of your first name and the first letter of your last name? And um, first of all, I love doing these because I have two last names. <laughs> Three names. There you go. Why won't it let me send it to you? I'm sending it to you right now. And, um, oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, it is three names, isn't it? That's fun. (laughs) (laughs) Look at you. You're so smart. So it's a what's your cat name? First letter of your first name. First letter of your last name. I (laughs) would. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I don't like mine. <laughs> I do. No. <laughs> Everybody, it's, my name. Your last name is so bad. My name, my name is awful. My cat name, according to this, is Goober Weinstein. <laughs> Goober Weinstein. I am for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> Goober, you can refer to me as Taco Bennington Doonesbury. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's Lady Taco, <laughs> Bennington Doonesbury. I like yours better. Yours, yours can be shortened down to, you know, Lady Bennington, and mine's Goober Weinstein. <laughs> You're Goober. What the hell? There are so many of these online, too. Here's another one. Step one, the last digit of your phone number with the first initial of your last name and the last digit of your age. Jeez, whoa. Let's find out if it's any better. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fine being named Taco. This is totally <laughs> fine. Are you? But you're not fine being named Goober. Goober Weinstein. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> you know who's a Goober Weinstein? <laughs> okay, according to this one. I am Miss. Ooh, I'm not married. I'm Miss. I have to do this twice again because the last name, I, I have two letters. I got mine. So mine is Professor Cutie Pie. <laughs> Wait. Professor Cutie Pie Pants. <laughs> this isn't good. This is not good. really bad. I am Miss Butch Handsome Von. <laughs> But <laughs> so can we combine these and and you can be Butch Taco and I can be Professor Goober? <laughs> yeah, I, like I want you to be Professor Goober, but I want to be Miss Taco. <laughs> okay, okay, you're Miss Taco. I'm Professor Goober. We got it. <laughs> I can't wait for someone to write a poem about us. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh my God. It would be like, um, I have a Gumby cat in mine. Her name is Miss Taco. <laughs> Professor Goober. Oh, we're so smart. Um, <laughs> Asparagus is still the best name for a cat. I agree. I know they give you some options in this book. Like I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who have cats named Mistopheles, yeah. or you know, definitely. I if I ever found a, a fat cat, like a real chunker that <laughs> looked like it was in a tuxedo, hundred percent naming that cat Buster Fitz Jones. You cannot stop me. <laughs> And then I make it wear a top hat because I am a monster. But, um, <laughs> but like Deuteronomy and Mongo Jerry, I can imagine people having those as cats. But in the naming of the cats, they give them such like very like crazy names. Mm -hmm. Like I don't want to name my cat Electra or Monkus Strap. <laughs> Apparently, T.S. Eliot legit had a lot of cats, and they genuinely had names just like this. Come here, Jelly Lorem. <laughs> <laughs> I think when I was looking at his cat names, the most like normal sounding one was Mr. Whiskus. Yeah, That's, or asparagus. Was... <laughs> I still like asparagus. <laughs> I'm looking for my cat asparagus. Have you seen him? <laughs> um, all of this makes me think of like Ernest Hemingway. Because <laughs> he has that house in Key West. It's full of cats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many he named asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a running list of all of Hemingway's cat names? Can we put that somewhere? And if I, sw I swear to God, if he named any of them after any of the cats and cats, I'm dead. I'm done. <laughs> See, 
See, if I ever, I always thought if I had cats, they would be named Marilyn Min Meow and Caddy Grant. Oh my god, that's so good. Um, we've been watching Ted Lasso, and there's a character on the show who, who had a cat, <laughs> and the cat's name was uh, just Cla- Claudia Schiffer. I like that. And I was like, that's good. Brill. This is totally brilliant. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, I, good ooh, one. I got a good one. Meowy Povich. <laughs> you are not the father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Listen, this is, I'm just going to start a whole writing list. This is just like during the Kentucky Derby where I just made up horse names. I made up some good horse names then. You did. I did. Um, we will, we will post those somewhere for people to see who did not see them, but those horse names were <laughs> epic. <sighs> you well, cannot deny it. <laughs> no! <laughs> that is not the animal we are focusing in on today. No. Back no. to cats. Um... So one reason the title is Practical Cats is because T.S. Eliot wanted to write about cats that actually did something and they weren't just merely laying around to be stroked. But that's what cats do. Well, not these. (laughs) Well, you know what? Maybe I need a time machine and find one of these practical cats. (laughs) A cat that can, can pay rent would be a real practical cat. And I am interested, too, because I guess Grizabella was actually part of all of this, but it was dropped because his friend said that they were too sad. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine the poem about the, about a cat that's just been, like, thrown out on the streets, like, mm-hmm. used and abused? Like, that'd be... De- I, I would not want to read that to a child. But I think sometimes that you should, because children should be more revealed to the world with certain things it's like death is going to be a thing old people are going to be like think about all the little kids are afraid of old people well i think the poems about old deuteronomy and gus the theater cat really already cover that yeah that's true but without being so depressing that you're just like i can't read this to the child yeah because now (laughs) i'm an adult crying right (laughs) oh just me sorry (laughs) right Um, is it, is it time to put, to put the book aside and... Do we need to just, like, talk about the, the stepping stone between the book and the movie real quick? I think we need to because I need to make something clear. (laughs) Okay, yeah. I, I feel like because the, the book is already... It was something that wasn't even supposed to be published. Mm -hmm. It was just a joke amongst friends. And then somehow it got published. And then somehow that became (laughs) one of the most successful stage shows of all time. And then 2019 happened. And if you were like an alien and you're trying to figure out human culture and you went from the T.S. Eliot book that shouldn't have been produced to the 2019 movie, I feel like that is something that will break somebody. Yeah. Like the... Yeah, if you if you skip this whole middle bit, you're just kind of like, wh- why? <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, and that's a good question. Why? 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 <laughs> why? 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 And, 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 you, I, you know what? You know how like sometimes if you search something, Google will also show you other questions. So when I was doing research into T. S. Eliot, one of the Google suggested questions was, why did T. S. Eliot write? <laughs> The book of practical cats because I just I just like that because I don't think that someone would look up you know why why did Stephen King write Carrie I don't yeah. think that people think about that but I do wonder I do think that people wonder why would someone write this it is yeah it uh, so between this book happening. And the movie that we are going to focus our time on, <laughs> which I, uh, there is a, there is a stage adaptation, um, and it's still one of the, it's still one of the top four longest running musicals ever on Broadway. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the top six in London. Um, 
It, it's won, uh, it won Best Musical at the Tonys. And there is a lot of debate about this musical. There's a lot of debate about a lot of musicals, but this one in particular threw people for a loop. And I mean, I guess, Christina, you know, you've, you've listened to all the music from the musical. Oh, yeah. And you knew of the musical before this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would like to know from my own personal, uh, my own personal thing, because I have had this discussion with a lot of people. What do you think the storyline is to Cats? Um, I would think that the storyline with the whole like rebirth thing and everything, mm-hmm. I I do think that there is like not a bad type of morality lesson with popularity is not the thing that's like most important. Sometimes the people who deserve a second chance don't necessarily have as many friends and stuff as everybody else. Like, I don't know. Does that does that make sense? It does. Okay. So you went a little more philosophical than I was. I'm sorry. I'm, like, <laughs> I'm a philosophical cat. <laughs> Philosophiles. <laughs> the magical Mrs. Philosophiles. I am Professor Goober Philosophies. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Philosophiles was my father. <laughs> Everybody deserves a second chance. <laughs> I am... Um, I always saw cats. Everyone's like, there's no storyline. Nothing makes sense. There's a storyline for sure. You just have to kind of look for it. Yeah. And I think the idea is once a year, um, these cats get together and it's almost like a, a beauty pageant. Right. Where each cat, or like a presidential election, each cat can nominate a cat to... (laughs) be sacrificed and be reborn um in an alien spaceship yes <laughs> in a in a tire that floats up on the stage with <laughs> laser lights okay it's 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 a thing and there's a lot of smoke okay it was a thing um <laughs> but you get to pick a cat who who has lived a full life who deserves to to use up one of their nine lives. That was always my understanding of cats. Mm-hmm. So whenever anyone's like, it's just a show that has no story, I'm like, there is. And, and it's true, you really have to like, I think most people just go into it and they're like, ugh, just a bunch of dancing cats. I don't think anyone sees like Mr. Philosophicles over here said, the, there is a deeper meaning <laughs> to a lot of this. There's this idea that goodness comes to those who deserve it and you Mm -hmm. can't just be you can't just be a fat cat like buster fitz jones and just be like well i'm fat and i ate a lot of food meow i should be reborn it's it's not as cut and dry as that yeah buster fitz jones it's and you i think there's a there's a big redemption quality to cats yeah 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 Cats is weird. I've seen Cats um, twice, and uh, it, it's, I don't know, it's its never one that I've particularly liked a whole lot, like I, but I still owned it. I still owned it on, I think, cassette tape, because yeah. I'm old as fuck, <laughs> and also on, like, CD and everything, and um, the, the cool part about Cats, for me, and I'm not a dancer, I, I did dance in theater just to get into theater but it's never been like a passion of mine I'm not particularly good at it but the cool part about cats for me was always the dancers it was like the way that their bodies move and everything and the choreography to it like that was pretty cool and it's completely absurd like you it's you dip into the surreal absurdity of like bestiality and 80s music it's just a strange place to be in but when you let yourself go and you let the cats take you to this place, it's yeah. all right. The the dancing in Cats is, if I were a professional dancer, this is a show I would want to be in. Yeah. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of professional dancers out there who are like, oh, no, you want to be in a chorus line? No. Oh, you want to be in Radio City Music Hall Christmas? Spe- no. <laughs> I'd want to be in Cats because we, Christina and I have a weird connection 
to the original Broadway cast of Cats. We do. We do. <laughs> we know Anna McNeely, who was the original Gumby Cat in Cats. And I still think about what she – she used to talk about her experience in Cats. Um, and those dancers are never at rest. You are right. constantly – engaging somehow with your body the entire time you are on stage. There's never a moment where your body gets to naturally rest into a pose or a movement. You're constantly up and moving. And that's always been something that every time I saw an iteration of Cats, it was always just like, I can't imagine doing, I can't imagine what you must feel like at intermission. Mm -hmm. To never have a rest, like you're, toes constantly pointed like everything is just like engaged the whole time I at the end of the night I would have to like take an ice bath I'd be done like I'm not a (laughs) dancer either the most dancing I have like I've I've taken tap I took some ballet I did you know all musical all forms of musical theater dance but I could never in a million years do what they do on that stage no cats is an experience it is. I think everyone should see it once. Yes. Uh, and I know that a lot of people are like, of Andrew Lloyd Webber's works, they really dislike that one the most. But I think a lot of those people didn't see Starlight Express. So I'd like you to rearrange your thinking just a little bit. You know, and to, to take a moment to talk about this, okay, I think that with theater, and this is where, like, bridging theater to the movie comes into play, yeah. because theater, when you go see a stage show, there is an aesthetic and a feeling to a stage show that you get, and I think a lot of people don't even realize what it is that they are being invited to, mm-hmm. and something like Cats really does have a very specific identity with the... Um, connection in the poetry to the music to the dancers and then the like leotards and the makeup and hair that they're in because all of that really does like it it glues together in one very specific way that if any of those fall apart the whole thing falls apart um it's like a a ball of yarn yeah um you just pull (laughs) at it like a cat and the whole thing falls apart so when you think about like movies that did a decent job in an adaptation, they have to decide how far they're going to stray from that aesthetic. And like something like Hamilton, okay, there's a very specific feel, the way the costumes are. If they were to do a legit movie where there's costumes and the locations change, that's kind of a risk. And it's one of the reasons why I think they do stuff like the Hamilton to Disney Plus because they already know that they have that identity and they don't want to fuck with yeah. it. And then when you see things like Les Mis or Chicago that stray so heavily away from the aesthetic, people are going to hate it or love it. Something like Chicago, I actually really like the movie and I like how detailed everything is in it and like that world. Whereas the stage show I like less because it's so simple. Yeah. And had I seen it in like the opposite way, I could feel differently about it. But then with Cats, you've got that that sensuality and the life of the cats with all the dancers. And then you watch the movie and everything's so tight and you don't see any of the dancers doing all that work in the background constantly that you just threw out like the coolest part yeah. of the show that someone like me, who I don't mean really, I mean, it's okay. It's an all right show. It's, it's just, like I said, not one that speaks to me specifically, but it's got some good stuff to it. The stuff I like from the show is gone. Yeah. When we, I, I will say, I wish that when we were talking about the movie version of Cats that we were just going to do the 1998 direct London stage show to VHS version. Because I was uh, it's like... It's a bit of a cheat, but it would have been a lot easier. It, it would have made me so happy. Um, now that we are translating into the 2019 version, I am upset about the fact that when it was first announced, it was announced that it was going to be an animated film. Mm -hmm. I need everyone to know that everyone in the world thought that Cats was going to be like the Aristocats or uh, Gay Purry, you know, which was another (laughs) animated cat movie if anyone hasn't seen that. Um, It's it's good. Shut up. Um, It's, you know, I... 
would have much preferred a full on like Disney scale animated feature of cats versus what I sat through. <laughs> And See, I, th- I feel like cats kind of <laughs> needs to be uh, well. They could do a cool cats depending on the look of the animation, and you could even incorporate some of the original drawings with the the book and like yeah. kind of take that. Even if it's not for the entirety of the movie, maybe just like a song or two. The animation style is almost like a dream sequence or something. Yeah, and, like, th- that originally like original um cartoon style. But I kind of feel like there needs to be that presence of the dancers in whatever the adaptation is yeah i think um because you've seen it twice you saw cats twice correct yes yes i also saw it twice (laughs) (laughs) um my first time okay i i sent you a video clip Mm -hmm. when i was watching cats because my (laughs) first time watching it i saw it at the alamo draft house and we saw, a, like, this was our, one of our last pre-COVID movies. And if I had known, I would have seen something else. But we saw the rowdy screening of Cats, a midnight showing, where you could say whatever you wanted to the screen. I do not remember it looking like it did on my TV. <laughs> like, I, watching it, I thought I was having, like, a fever dream. I was like, this, why do I see so many human hands and human feet? I clearly recall a different look unless I was that drunk when I because I was loaded when I saw cats in theaters that's right I paid to see it in a movie theater see I I I did pay to see it but it was in the middle of the quarantine lockdown and I don't know why but something was stuck in the back of my head like let's watch cats tonight so we got like a bottle of wine and it wasn't enough like I needed more than just one bottle of wine maybe a hammer I'm not sure but uh yeah, it's it's um it's 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 the type of bad movie that's like it makes bad movies sound bad. Yeah. It, it's not even as fun to watch as some bad movies. Yeah. There's a there's categories for bad films. Like we love bad films. I love bad movies. But there is there's bad and then there's why. Yeah. And this is definitely a, a why. Um and to your to your point about, you know, incorporating the dancers, I think one of the biggest issues with the 2019 version of Cats is that they tried they tried to toe the line between letting us know these are actors and cats. So mm-hmm. they have these human faces with these CGI bodies, but the cats don't have cat features. There's no you know, there's there's no genitalia on any of the cats. And I'm not saying I wanted that either. There, I don't want, I don't need a butthole copy of cats. But what the Steed show has, you understand is these are human dancers in these body suits. So you know they're wearing clothes. Mm-hmm. Whereas in this 2019 version, it's just a bunch of naked cats except for the break dancers who were sneakers <laughs> and rum tum tugger i guess wears a coat over his fur coat and don't even get me started on rebel wilson taking off her fur and revealing fur underneath <sighs> i am <laughs> but do you well, know then, what i mean uh, like if it, they yeah yeah it, it you just it, this is where it all starts falling apart once we get to it so the the movie is the 2019 movie, and it's directed by um, Tom Hooper, and yeah. he is known for a couple of good movies. Like, but the problem is he's not a he's not the right. I don't think he's the right director for this. They no. saw like Les Mis, and then they thought he's got it, but he's someone that does not understand like what Cats was trying to do on the stage. And then he has, he must not have any idea about CGI or animation or what it takes to be an artist or anything like that. Cause it seems like he thought that you just gave it over to the art department and he wanted them to do like two years worth of work in like six months. So these poor guys are like locked at their desks doing the CGI. And then there's the hysterical article that I hope everybody read where it's the guy and he 
admits that there is a butthole cut yeah. of cats because they were doing the fur processing for them and somebody hit something and they're like, holy shit, what's the fur doing? It looks like a butthole. And they had to correct the CGI for that. Like, it's just... It, it's such a cluster. It's such a mess. And I feel bad for the animators. I feel bad for all the people who worked really hard on the movie. I feel bad for the actors who were told during pre-production, don't worry, it's going to look cool. Yeah. And then they're in these ridiculous outfits, seeing each other basically naked on set. And they're all being told, don't worry, it's going to look really cool when it's all done. <laughs> and then this happens. Well, that whole effects company went under because of this movie awful like there are visual effects is something that really doesn't get enough like respect i feel like in the film industry especially Mm -hmm. because it's always put under the arts and science category um at like uh the oscars and those are usually the ones where they do the lunch like two days before. And it's like really... the daytime. Yeah, yeah they're not really it. given the respect that they deserve. And then you have these people who are working 90 hours, you mm-hmm. know, 90 hour work weeks to like four months to put together this like two hour long. They had like two and a half months to make a trailer and then four months to do a movie. Like, That's crazy. The amount of work that they put into this and then... Yes, on this podcast, we are making fun of this movie. But I will I will say, the visual effects, they did their thing. You it's know? not their fault, yeah. Yeah, it's n- none of this is, is their fault, and they deserve a hell of a lot more respect for what they were mm-hmm. able to get done in four months. Yeah. In four months, and, and Tom Hooper was like, I don't like this, let's fix it. Yeah. Like a month before the movie was set to come out. <laughs> so it's like, not only did they only have four months to do a whole movie, but on top of that, they had one month to fix a whole movie. So I yeah. I want everyone to take a moment to a just silence. respect those people. Yeah. Yeah. Let's pour a little, a little milk on the ground for those who tried. So the way they frame up this version of Cats. Cats... Cats the Seed Show is very much in the same vein of Les Mis. There's no talking. It's it's operatic. Or meowing. Or yeah, meowing. There's, meow. There's a lot of meowing. It's mostly singing throughout the entire show. There's no... At no time does anyone go, look over there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all these cats just hanging out and singing songs. Um, which they decided was not good in... <laughs> The, the the 20 <laughs> they decided that wasn't good in 2019 and they needed to elaborate on things by having a new character introduced victoria who this woman who plays victoria she's from the royal ballet she's she's a phenomenal dancer so yeah. mad props to her but she is brought in as an additional cat who apparently does not know what it means to be a jellical cat. So then the film is now focused on teaching her what it means to be a jellical cat, um, teaching her the traditions, teaching her about what's happening with old Deuteronomy and why all these cats are singing songs about themselves. Um, and then she's also the love interest for Mr. Mistopheles, <laughs> which... As we have said numerous times, numerous times on this podcast, you do not need to bring in a love interest. It is not necessary. It's not necessary. It, hey, Hollywood, it's not necessary. They're cats. <laughs> they're just cats. <laughs> they don't. They don't. <laughs> the desperation in your voice. <laughs> I'm just. They're just cats. <laughs> they don't need to fall in love. We didn't, <laughs> we didn't need it. Because by making her the love interest, they turn the magical Mr. Mistopheles into a bumbling idiot. <laughs> Why? Because, oh, this really pretty dancer won't fall for just any cat. It has to be a love. It has to be a transformation for the magical Mr. Mistopheles. He can't be good at the start. He has to work his way up. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He's a cat. 
there there is no story in the original book and then there is a story in the stage show but I, I feel like most people won't even like not most people but a lot of people could enjoy cats and not even truly realize that there's a story so you don't in adding more story you're actually making it more complicated and harder to accept yeah yeah exactly and then in addition to adding her oh my god i'm i'm going to talk about McCavity for just mm-hmm. a hot second because they introduce him right away yeah right away at the very beginning of the movie which has not happened in the stage show Everyone knows who McCavity is in the stage show. He's the bad cat, and you don't want to be around him because he's, like, the tough guy. Um, He's a mystery cat, um, as they say in the poem and the song. Um, But in this version, he does a lot of talking. (laughs) And his goal in... They expanded McCavity to be a villain in the film, in which the stage show, he is not... Ish. He does Ish, steal yeah. Deuteronomy in the stage show. But it's not what it is in this movie. Because in this movie, <laughs> he is kidnapping cats by turning them into, like, magic kitty litter or something. Yeah. <laughs> and hiding them on a barge with Growl Tiger, who is not even in the stage musical. So interesting ad there. Um, cool, bring in the racist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. They added... Hey, everybody, we forgot the racist back at the book. We better bring him up. <laughs> yeah. Andrew, why wasn't he in your stage show? What? We're putting him in the movie. Um, <laughs> well, we didn't include him because he was a big old racist who didn't like any of the foreigners. Oh, no. Oh. We already finished. Yeah. The movie's Ooh. out. Andy, yeah. Do it's you think out. we should hire that team again to fix this? <laughs> um, <laughs> we fired them all. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Looks like we have to keep the racist in. Oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hate to see it happen. Yeah. Or it's so uh, words are difficult about this movie because so they kidnap McCavity kidnaps all of these cats who are trying to put themselves up to be reborn. That's not a thing in the musicals. It's not a thing in the poems. I just don't understand where that idea came from. But you know what? That's that's fine, I guess. But this was the classic thing that happened when I watched the movie with my husband, Carlos, and he asked me why the cats were getting stolen. (laughs) Because I know... I, and this wasn't like this time. It was the time I didn't make him watch it a second time. So it was the first time, and he he looks at me like, "Can you explain it?" No, <laughs> I can't explain what's going on. I don't know what the fuck is happening. <laughs> this is this isn't the same. I've never seen this before. Yeah, I, this was a whole Mariah Carey. I don't know her situation. Yeah. Like the whole time, it's like it's like the stage show of Cats, or even you know what the nineteen ninety eight version of Cats versus the twenty nineteen version of Cats. You have the good twin and the evil twin, and one of them has to die. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> but you cannot be reborn. <laughs> you must go. <laughs> like it's, it is mind boggling to me how this happened, mm-hmm. because then in addition to adding in those things, they gave a lot of screen time. And a lot of talking time to Rebel Wilson and James Corden. Mm -hmm. It. (laughs) So we're in Rum Tum Tugger song, which comes right after Rebel Wilson as the Gumby cat who eats human cockroaches and strips off her flesh to reveal more flesh. Um, (laughs) That's the best way to describe it. That's what she does, right? It's so confusing. It doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, and I was, yeah. I, for some reason, I thought that, I don't know why. For some reason, I thought the first time I watched the movie that 
that song got pushed into later. Like, I feel like I read a review that maybe wasn't written well, and they made it sound like it was a long time until that happened, but it's not. It's no. it's within the first, basically, like, few minutes. And when it happens, it's just such a shock that you're disquieted for the rest of the movie. Yeah. It's like when that scene happens and there is no rhyme or reason and the laws of reality are broken so badly it's hard to just relax for the rest of the movie you're kind of like on edge yeah it's like the uncut gems of musicals like you're stressed yeah. the whole rest of the film you're just like i just want it to stop right you're pacing you're sweaty you're like what's happening why does my heart hurt um but during rum tum tugger's song which is done by jason derulo um <laughs> but I'm sorry, yeah. I keep interrupting you. There's just so many, many yeah, There's so much. Keep going. And like, there's so much in this. That, that's a with, mess. With Rum Tum Tugger, I can't even say it. Rum Tum. Rum Tum Tugger. Rum. Rum. Wait. <laughs> rum, rum the drink. Tom, tom tugger. like your tummy. Tugger like Tigger, but without an eye. Rum Tum Tugger. Yep is a curious cat. <laughs> so that song is so much fun. Like I loved that song yeah. when I was a kid. That was like the one that I'd always play in my little like Broadway um, collection CD. And you've got Jason Derulo and he seems to be enjoying himself, but the song does not. The song is still it, like, for some reason it falls flat. Yeah. Why? It's, it's a good song and someone that's having fun and it still falls flat. It felt like it was slowed down. A lot of the it songs, did. they, I am the type of person who is so annoying that I I will, like, you know, mumble along a little bit to myself when I'm watching yeah. it on my own. Sure. I think we know what you're talking yeah, about. <laughs> but this, it's so hard to keep beat with the musical numbers in this movie because they're not at the same tempo as a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. And I definitely think that the ones that suffer the most are Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser, which we will get to because I can't, and Rum Tum Tucker. I think that it is off mm -hmm. by a beat. And it's just right. like, I think that's where the disconnect is happening. And I think it's just, it's just a weird way to do that song. It is a fun song. It's fun. It's a beat. Everyone's like, I'm the rap time tiger, boo dee 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 dee. And like, you get in the stage show, you get Mr. Mistopheles, who's just like, ugh, eh, whatever. He's from Tom Tiger. But in, in this, it's not, it's not an enjoyable experience for me. Mm hmm. No. And then he's all like, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of that also goes back to Rebel Wilson's character as the Gumby Cat because they cut to her twice in the middle of his song. Yeah. And she's talking like, uh, she has a joke about him being um, uh, spayed or neutered. What, did, what do you do to cats? I don't know. She has a joke about him not being able to reproduce kittens because he's singing high notes. Mm. Which I was mm -hmm. like, didn't need that, but thank you. <laughs> and then they cut to her again after Jason Derulo has, Jason, I, every time I, I want to sing his name, just like that. Um, <laughs> but he does this like neat little dance moment and then they cut back to Rebel Wilson and she's like, I can dance like that too. And then she does her little break dance moment and it's like, <laughs> why? Why was that necessary? Are you just going to film yourself redoing everything from the 2019 movie? I'm going, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to re-edit the movie and just cut some some things. Um, it's so, like, there's every portion of the movie is mind-boggling. Yeah. Because during, like, that sequence and everything, when you've got the cats, okay, who, you know what a cat looks like. Yeah, meow, yeah. And you know the sizes that they typically are. And then they're played by full-grown people. Yeah. But the full-grown people at some times almost look like cats are just ginormous. And then other times it looks like they've done this big world where they're in the alleyway. So they are the actual sizes of cats. But then if a cat is leaning against a wall or a bar and is on like a bar stool, 
You're talking okay. like a, a 50 pound cat, which is a horrifying thought. Okay. We're getting into what I want to talk about, which is, <laughs> um, perspective. Yes. And it, it is the most notable when we talk about the atrocity that is the Mungo Jerry and Rumple teaser number. Um, <laughs> They completely changed that entire song from the stage version to the movie version. It is so slowed down in the movie. It doesn't make any sense as to why, especially when your film costs money. Okay? It costs money. And it the faster the song, the shorter the number. <laughs> Speed it up. It, it's a simple it's a simple fix. Uh, could they not do it? I don't know. I wasn't on stage. But it should have been... You know what? I digress. Um, I am getting really heated over here. I can tell you are. I can tell you are. <laughs> and I think I think the people need to know I am currently wearing my cat's sweatshirt. I am drinking out of my cat's The Musical Cup. I am still wearing cat ears. I am livid. Because what happens at the end of that musical number is a dog comes upstairs to the house that they have broken into. Uh, because Victoria has been taken in by Mungo Jerry and Rumple Teaser to go steal from an old lady's house. And of course, the bumbling idiot that is now Mr. Mistopheles comes to save her. Uh, uh, Victoria, I'm here to save you. Um, I like that you keep calling him a bumbling idiot. <laughs> because that's what they made him into. Like he, in the, in the seed show, he can do magic. His, his whole chest lights up like a Christmas tree at one point. Uh, <laughs> And then he does a jump in the... I, I, okay. We're talking about the movie. I'm sorry, everybody. I am very... Pa- this is a very passionate one-year anniversary episode. Um, <laughs> they go to the door to close the door so the dog doesn't get in. They are so small, they could be playing mice. Right. Then yep. they escape... And they're in the alleyway with all the other cats. And then they are cat size. But then, I don't know if a lot of people notice this. They are, they're in the, the, in the alleyway talking to the other cat. It's, it's Mr. Misophily is in Victoria. And the other cat looks at Victoria. And on her wrist is a pearl and diamond <laughs> ring around her wrist like a bracelet. Yeah. I just want to say... Has anyone seen what a, a ring looks like and seen what a cat's paw looks like? <laughs> now tell me, tell me seriously, um, how'd you get that ring around that girl's paw? How'd you do it? What kind of mystical magic does Mr. Mistopheles have to make this ring fit around her paw like a bracelet? I'm sorry, I just, I cannot suspend belief enough for this one moment. And it's a quick second because he does his little thing and slides it off and puts it into his hat. Cool. But you know what? Size <laughs> size does matter here. Okay. Well, it just, I, I love, I love creativity with something like this. Like you, you talk about what they did in the Lord of the Rings movies or you talk about... Um, Darby O'Gill and the Little People, yeah. the Disney Irish movie. I watch it every year because my husband introduced me to it, and it's fucking awesome. It's and amazing. I have it on TV. It's amazing. TV. Yeah. <laughs> that antiquated technology. Um, <laughs> and I just love seeing how much thought they put into these shots. And you have to think about perspective and, okay, we're going to put this way over there. We're going to make like a 30 foot cup in order to make it look the right size. It's just so smart. And how many people either were told, shut the hell up. I'm doing what I'm doing. Don't ask questions. I bet you that's one of them. Or there's the other boat, which is, I don't fucking know above my pay grade. And they yeah. just like keep going with it. Why? There are so many people between props department, lighting, the actor, the director, all these people who should have gone, why is that ring around your hand? Yeah. Like, and who's, who was either silenced or who didn't care to ask? Yeah. It's just, unless that woman's finger is the <laughs> oh, size of an Italian sausage. <laughs> It's it's just not going to fit 
over a cat's paw. I just don't, I can't make it work for you people. It just doesn't. And this, the shenanigans need to stop. Uh. It, it just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in a pose like Stefan from SNL with my hands over my mouth because I cannot, it is just something that my brain cannot compute. <laughs> you think about, there's like this thing where when they started talkies and they added sound to movies that when they first started doing scores to movies, they had already been doing music for a while, but when mm-hmm. scores were actually incorporated into like the background noise of a movie that some audience members got scared because they were like, where's that, where's that sound coming from? Because they didn't understand, like it's to set a tone and a mood and it's a whole thing. And then finally, like people got used to it. So if you think about our pea brains as humans and how some people were afraid of background score music, what does this movie actually do to your brain? When yeah. You see the proportions not matching left and right. Yeah. It's just, and, and then it just continues from there. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's the first... I think I knew something was off <laughs> from the beginning. I think everyone does. But that is such a glaring omission. And the director has the final say. I mean, you went back and fixed the movie, but you couldn't figure out how to make this scene work. Right. Did we even need that? No. It's just, it is a mess. It is all over the place. It feels like they had a general idea of what it was that they wanted to do. Bring Cats the musical from stage to screen. And then everything fell off the rails. They were like, well, how do we do it? What do we do? How do we make this work? Because as it continues, it just gets more glaringly obvious that apparently in London, Cats are the size of Stuart Little. (laughs) I just, I just can't, unless they're in a building, then they're the size of cats. Or or really big cats. Think about what a 60 pound cat looks like. That's terrifying. (laughs) They are the walruses of cats. (laughs) (laughs) It just doesn't. And uh, then we have some. What would you do? I was like. You don't know me. I'm like, ma'am, I'm looking for my cat, asparagus. And then I go, oh, thank God, there he is. And then you turn and you just see a 60-pound cat with a giant ring around its wrist. Oh, I've been looking for that ring. It's my grandmother's. And then you, like, pick it up and then I see you put it on, like, this, like, two-foot circumference (laughs) finger of yours. Just one big hand. What, like fucking salvador dali yeah. world are we living in that that's like the clifford sense. the big red dog of cats <laughs> and then the cat walks away and there's no butthole <laughs> <laughs> just a tail there is a tail and no butthole and it but it's smooth so yes. you can definitely see where it should be but it's not there it's oddly smooth yeah <laughs> the cat has human hands and human feet yeah. It's 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 not good. It's, <laughs> it's not, monstrous. It's not good for anybody. I am. I'm sorry. And but you see I, another cat go by, and it's got like sneakers on. Oh, don't worry. He likes to. Uh, he likes to dance. I clearly, clearly remember seeing a version without human hands and human feet. And maybe I am just wishing that that was something I saw. It could be wish fulfillment. Um. The. <laughs> We still haven't talked about the oddity that is the catchphrases for (laughs) for McCavity. You mean like magic? (laughs) Favorite for one. Every time McCavity turns someone into kitty litter, um, he has to say something. And it is so funny. It is probably... I have never laughed so hard in a movie. I've never... I... (laughs) When we saw this in theaters, and it was the rowdy screening, there had been people who had seen it already mm-hmm. because they had been doing these rowdy screenings for a while. And I didn't realize that it was going to become a Rocky Horror situation where every time he disappeared, we all had to shout out his catchphrase. 
So imagine being in a theater. You are close to three sheets to the wind. You are with a gaggle of very judgy people who are all really excited to scream about cats. And then all at the same time, as soon as Idris Elba disappears, they all go, magic! (laughs) I loved it. I cannot wait for this to become a midnight movie special because I would go again and again. I've got. Cat I would definitely ears now. go. I would definitely go. Someone needs to make this a thing. I yeah. would. I. I would gladly take on the role of old Deuteronomy. I have a <laughs> cane in my apartment right now. I've got weird looking knees too. I can. <laughs> <laughs> um. I just like. There's just so much to unpack with this. Besides their sizing, I mean, and the well, weird with, love story. With, with McCavity, Idris Elba, I, like, you look at some of the actors that may have been a part of it, like one was Anne Hathaway, and yeah. just imagine Anne Hathaway in this movie. Oh my God. I don't think, she, I think she would possibly murder Tom Hooper. I don't oh, know yeah. what would happen. Oh yeah, she definitely would have. Are you kidding me? But poor Idris Elba, I just... Uh, He's yeah. he scares me in this movie. There's something about his body in cat form, and he's naked, but he's yeah. got like a. You know what the a, thing is? What? If you look at all the other cats, every other cat in this movie, even Jason Derulo, they all have. They're all like calico and you know yeah. Maine Coon mix. You know they have. Let me drop in some cat names. What they all? I don't have even know like what you're talking blend. about. But I'm like, uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> they all have a blend of colors and fur. So you look this at like just, Taylor Swift. Yeah. She's she's got like stripes and stuff and a white belly and like blonde looking fur. All of this stuff. All of these cats have a multitude of colors. Idris Elba's fur is the color of his flesh, and he looks <laughs> naked the entire time. But he's naked without any nipples. He doesn't have a penis. He doesn't have a butthole so he's <laughs> your brain is going he is naked but he is clothed but he is naked i and don't like it he dances with taylor swift and i'm just like <laughs> this is why it's the uncut gems of movie musicals i am stressed to the guilt like i can't i it makes me feel so uncomfortable yeah. like i feel uncomfortable right now <laughs> and i I know I can, like, Google search a picture of him, but I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to see it again. Because the thing, and it's... A crime has been yeah. committed. Yeah, but McCavity wasn't there. Um. <laughs> <laughs> pew, pew. Um, it's... <laughs> it is just... Um, <laughs> It messes with your brain. It's like a a weird optical illusion. It's the Uncanny Valley stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't really feel that way about all the other cats. Okay, they're cats. Yeah, they don't have nipples. No, they don't have buttholes. They don't have any genitalia at all whatsoever. Some of them are wearing shoes. Some of them are wearing coats. Okay, but when Idris Elba takes off his hat and his coat, he is fully butt naked. And that is all I can think. And he's the only one that does that for me in the entire thing. Because, like, Victoria is oh, just... Oh, I see. He does it for you, huh? Wink. Now, apparently Jason Derulo was the one who was <laughs> yeah. all upset because they, they CGI'd out his penis. And he got all up in arms about that. They said it was too big. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't even talk about him screaming milk. <laughs> We've done it. I've done it twice already on the podcast. We didn't even mention it. That's his thing. He just screams milk for no reason. <laughs> it makes me feel so uncomfortable. The whole thing. The yeah. whole thing. I will say the only cat. I'm sorry. I Just yeah. to go back real quick to Idris Elba. Go for Idris it. Idris Elba is just... I I like him, and I feel like he hasn't always gotten the best career choices thrown at him, and that's, like, a bit of a shame, because I think he's just as good, if not better, than other actors that maybe have had it easy, and there, I know so many women that just love Idris Elba, and I, like, the love for Idris Elba is a thing on a sexual level, and to take a man who's good looking and he, 
you know, has a good body and everything and to make him horrifying is a crime. Yeah. And how they did it, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how they fucked up that badly. Uh, that could be the title of this episode. <laughs> Right. Like, that's our subheader. Like, how did this... Because it's the whole thing. It's not just Idris. He is a yeah. gorgeous man. He is yeah. He is amazing. He's a gorgeous man, and he's a strong actor. And you can see he that is. in this film. Yeah. He knows, he knows what he's supposed to be doing. And everything after that was at the decision of the director of the film. He had no control over that. One of the ways I feel bad is the whole thing where when he disappears and he either meows or he says magic or whatever, I think that's supposed to be funny and it is, but not for the reason why they think it is. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a jokey bit, but it's not, it didn't land as being a joke. It landed as being a serious moment that we all (laughs) now have taken and laughed at for a long time. I laugh about it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, there are moments where it looks like they are trying to make a joke and mm-hmm. it's just not working. Right. Like the stuff with Buster Fitzjones, James Corden, who we mm-hmm. didn't talk about and I really don't want to go into it. I'm not, That's okay. I'm not a fan of him, but sorry. Uh, not sorry. There is, <laughs> he, he does the Rebel Wilson thing of pulling focus right. in his number, and it is, it's not funny. Yeah, yeah. And that's the yeah. problem is that I think that they thought, we'll get Rebel Wilson and James Corden in here, and we'll inflect it with, like, a, we'll get some jokey bits going on because they're funny. You, what was given to us was not funny. Right. And it's... Unfortunately, you could. I look. We both watched it twice already. It doesn't get any funnier with multiple viewings. Yeah, like, and I, yeah. I think that there is a little bit of a play on their bodies, and they are two people, particularly when thrust up against someone from fancy ballet places yeah. and Idris Elba and Jason Derulo, that their bodies are bigger. So I think that some of the humor relies on look at these two bigger cats. Isn't that funny? And that's like extremely cheap humor. Yeah. That's not funny at all. And T.S. Eliot, even though I've got my problems with him, the poems are funny. Yeah. And then you've got the stage show that makes such like beauty out of these bodies and the you know mixing the female form and the feline form and all this like stuff going into play and then when you resort resort to like fat jokes it's yeah it's cheap because even even in the stage show when we are introduced to uh jenny any dots as our gumby cat she does do what rebel wilson does in the um in the movie where she like strips off this big fur coat, it is not nearly as crazy in the stage show version as it appears <laughs> in the movie. The movie made me gag. I'm not even joking. She's unzipping herself and I'm just like, Ugh. I thought she was just going to be bleeding. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. That's my personal thoughts. But she, she's a, she's still a dancer underneath of that. So to cheapen it by, by, being like, oh, we'll just get someone who's a bit bigger and make her into the the fat, lazy house cat. I was like, no, I don't, I don't fully appreciate that. And then even though they gave James Corden the role of Buster Fitzjones, there is something that they did with the CGI where it doesn't go all the way up to his face. <laughs> so he has a very thin neck. And then a very large chest and stomach area. And it looks like uh, the Master of Disguise when they did that turtle thing. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is what he looks like. Yeah. It is not a good look. And then he spends most of his time when he is talking instead of singing, just eating. Mm-hmm. And Buster Fitzjones, the, the cat from the, you know, from the poem, he's not just about food. Mm-hmm. He's a, he's the cat we all greet when we walk down the street. Like he's, mm-hmm. he's the upper crust. He is, he has the fancy cat, you know, he, he has a tuxedo and he, he's a member of all these clubs. Food is second to that. 
he's, you know, he's hoity-toity first. And mm-hmm. instead they turned him into a joke. Well, and uh, to be clear, too, like, I think it's great if you want to have a cast that is inclusive of yeah. a lot of different body types, but to use one specific body type and just make fun of it the whole time, that's not inclusion, that's exploitation. Yeah. And that's where it's, like, kind of a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> That's where it's a bummer? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, one of the sources of the bum. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Christina, did you watch this? There were no bums in this. <laughs> I watched it, saw no bums. There isn't even a, a line that defines a butt. Professor Gumby Philosophies is concerned. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not Gumby, I'm Goober. Goober. Professor Goober Philosophies, excuse me. <laughs> Miss Taco is concerned that Professor Goober <laughs> can't remember Professor Goober's name. <laughs> um, I'm a Gumby Goober. <laughs> I I will say that um, the thing that bothered me a lot about the movie also was Helen Mirren's knees, but that's just a me thing. <laughs> because I I mentioned this to Jesse. If you are going to do cats, you cannot go halfway. You can't be like, oh, they're humans. Remember, they're humans dressed as cats. But remember, they're cats. You can't have it both ways. And what the stage show does a really good job of is you are, you know that these are humans in leotards doing dances to these songs. What the movie does is it really still toes the line between look at this human face on this cat body doing human type movements because Helen Mirren at the end of that movie sits down on top of that statue and bends her legs in a way a cat could never. (laughs) And it, it is something that has sat with me since I saw it in theaters. That was the one thing I took away from it. And when it happened, I remember audibly gasping and everyone in the theater laughing at me (laughs) because I, she sits like a human with (laughs) knees bent over the edge of a statue. Y'all ever see a cat sit with knees bent over the edge of a statue? They sit They sit with their legs straight out. I don't think they know that their knees can bend that way. I don't, I don't want to pretend to know what's going on in a cat's brain. But this does not compute. This whole movie does not compute. Like, it, I feel like I am having a major malfunction. <laughs> uh, I, you know, T.S. Eliot, he made this comment about cats and how the reason why he loved them so much was because they had two qualities to an extreme degree, dignity and comicality. And I feel like this movie has one of those in a large quantity, but it's unintentional. Yeah, I know. I 100% agree. It's, it's not, I don't think, I think everyone went into it thinking that it was going to be serious art. I think everyone thought it was going to be the next Les Mis when they got into it. I think so too. Because I, like, 100%. Les Mis is also not a great stage to screen adaptation. We're not we're not going to go into um, Inspector Javert at all um, for the purposes of this today. But um, maybe later. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> One day more. No, we'll talk about it later. Why don't you want to speak to me? <laughs> <laughs> it's. I do think that everyone thought that this was going to be the next big thing because. We don't really have movie musicals anymore. It's not like the golden age of Hollywood where we... I know. We, I miss musicals. Me too. Like, I I love a good movie musical. You sit me down for hours. I'll watch Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. I don't care how problematic that promise is. Um, <laughs> Sound of Music. I'll watch it. You know? Mm-hmm. Any... You know, for me and my gal, Brigadoon. You name it. I've seen it. I love it. I'll watch it. Ooh, West Side Story. Love it. Watch it. Thanks for your input, Jess. Brigadoon. Um, <laughs> Brigadoon. Of all movies. I, I love movie musicals, and it is a shame that we don't have, we don't have that now. Like there was a period of time where we, we were getting Funny Girl and Hello Dolly. You know, we were. We were spoiled with the riches of movie musicals, and then they just kind of died off and. You know, we got Rent, and we got Chicago, and then everything translated back to 
Disney having to really continue that with some not so great things that everyone seems to think are really good. I'm but part, part of like the, the thing with it too is like, I, I miss original musicals. Yes. Uh, I mean, Disney, the cool thing about Disney was that yes, they took these like classic tales and then they added music and it is original to, you know, a certain respect, but think about when I was just very little was when Nightmare Before Christmas came out, and mm-hmm. that's a musical. And then being in middle school and Moulin Rouge is out. And again, that's like taking already, um, you know, currently available music and just redoing it. But still, it's like original musicals in film. It's a lot of fun. And when you do an adaptation, the ease of it is that it's already laid out. It's a map that's there. So you just have to like not fuck it up. But then the problem is you have to not fuck it up. And it's very easy to do that. It's just that everyone seems to think that we want more and that we don't like, I just want, I just want it. So give it, please stop adding to it. I would be more excited to find out that Lin-Manuel Miranda was working with some filmmaker that I really like in an original movie musical than to find out that they were redoing Hamilton again, but as like a movie movie, yeah. like, I would be more excited to find out something new is coming. Yeah. And like, I completely understand that when translating a, you know, a musical to a film, there's a lot of stuff that has to be kind of, you know, taken out, readjusted. I'm, I fully understand that. But whatever they did to Cats, because they cut a lot of stuff from Cats. They cut lines Mm -hmm. from the songs. Yeah. They cut, like, and I mean, they cut, like, a big chunk from from the the addressing of Cats, which is, like, the opening number. Like, I know. (laughs) How did you manage to do that? And then they cut a lot of different things here and there. And it's... It's fully understandable as to why you have to do it. Run times, things like that. But somehow they managed... This is the bring it on effect. In bring it on, (laughs) they had every routine. They just had to do them. And then they didn't. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, there's all other reasons for that. Everyone's seen bring it on. Shut up. But (laughs) all they had to do was do cats and they didn't. They no. it feels almost especially when you're at the beginning and they there's this whole section where they're explaining like well, tonight is the night of the Jellico Moon and what we're going to do is have all these cats sing all these songs for us to decide who's going to be reborn. I don't need you to explain that to me. Mm-hmm. Why are you dumbing down literally dumbing down characters and dumbing down the plot for me? Cats if you're one of those people who doesn't think Cats has a plot, then why give people a plot? If you're one of the people who think Cats has a plot, we don't need it explained to us. Mm-hmm. The people who are seeing this musical are not people who don't understand Cats. Because those are the people who are paying for these tickets. I'm, I, don't, I fully don't expect a 13-year-old child to be like, ooh, a movie about a cat sounds great. And go into it blind. Musical mm-hmm. theater people see musicals. And musical theater people bring their non-musical theater friends to see musicals. A rando on the street is not just going to be like (laughs) Russian roulette of movie and see cats. And then decide they love it because they understand the storyline so well. Yeah. Yeah. And and the stage show, it's, it's a thing where it shouldn't work, but it does. And it does for a wide ranging audience. You get, you know, the rich old ladies going to go see it. You've got kids going with their parents yeah. it's probably one of the first shows they ever even see is going to be cats and it a wide range between those two like you don't even have to be a theater kid theater kid to enjoy it but to try and make lightning hit twice yeah and the second time is with naked idris elba <laughs> and without all of the proper lines and with a whole new plot it, what are you doing honestly though if everybody who was in that movie was just naked, it probably would have fared better than if you put everybody in these CGI cat suits naked. Well, it, 
You think about Idris Elba just as a person naked. Idris Elba in a theater appropriate leotard with the hair and everything. And he just storms into the room right now. That, I mean, I'm going to be, oh, what, what are you guys doing? But then the CGI one yeah. comes in, I'm going to be screaming my head off. <laughs> that is just a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah like if you put Idris Elba on a London stage in a costume from Cats if you put Jason Derulo in the Rum Tum Tugger you know the he's got that weird it v-neck work. thing I am all here for it that costume those costumes on those two people would I would work. die yeah it'd the, be pretty cool I would be all about it the CGI though oh no <laughs> Even imagine Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift in, like, if she was one of those people, Halloween comes around, she dresses up yeah. like a cat for Halloween. She could look super freaking cute. Yeah. And, and almost identical, but it's, like, real and not a CGI nightmare. Yeah. And to, to her benefit, I will say, at least when she was singing Macavity, it was in the correct tempo <laughs> as a Broadway show. So more yeah. props to you there. I will say this. I didn't think we needed an extra musical number, and I understand why, because in order to be nominated for an Academy Award, you have to have an original song that has never been done on stage or screen previously. So I completely understand adding a new song. I mean, Hairspray did it, but they put it in their end credits. (laughs) We've really... I'm sorry, I just remembered something. (laughs) Oh, God, what? (laughs) The first time that we watched it, Carlos thought that the Victoria chick was Taylor Swift oh. for part of the movie. Oh. And I made some sort of comment like, oh, when's Taylor Swift going to show up? And he looked at me like, idiot. She's been <laughs> here the whole movie. And then I had to explain that's not Taylor Swift. And then he kind of like gave up, I think, at that point. Like, oh, I can't. Like, I think this? a lot but, of people did that, though. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, because they made such a big deal about her being in it. Right. Um, and it is kind of cool to Taylor Swift's like credit. Yeah. When you think about the idea of her doing something like Cats, then she was also in that X-Men movie. Like, that's kind of a cool, fun little yeah. group of movies that she's chosen to not cameo in. But, you know, I'm sure she gets a lot of offers. So yeah, being in those two, it's kind of cool, but too bad that <laughs> yeah, one of them was this. But at least she at least she was doing what she was good at. You yeah. know, she got to sing, and she got to dance with naked Idris Elba, so... Yeah, there you go. More power to her. I mean, there's not <laughs> a lot of women who can say they dance with him naked, and she's won. <laughs> I'm going to give you an award for that one, Taylor Swift. Um, we have talked about every aspect of this, and still not touched on Grizabella. Well, think about that. The star, the moment, the big moment, one of the greatest songs in Broadway history, and it is completely lost and forgotten in this movie because of all of the confusion. It's mind-boggling to me that we it took us this long to get to her because when you when people think about cats, they don't think about the Jellicle Cat song. Some might say, oh, well, Rum Tum Tugger. The number one song from Cats is Memory. Memory. And we have not talked about Grizabella at all. Nope. Um, she did not need. <laughs> she. She's done dirty. She was done real dirty. She did not need a storyline where they were all like, oh, that's Grizabella. And she, she hung out with Macavity, and that's why we don't talk to her. No, she never did that. That is not a thing that would ever happen. Her song is not about her, you know, turning her back on her fellow Jellicle cats and then hanging out with, you know, naked Idris Elba. Her song is about, you know, being, you know, she had this great life. You know, right. she she lived this amazing life where she was loved and then she was put out on the streets and then she had to make her own home. She had no one else really to care for her. Like, that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. 
like the postman sighs as he scratches her head. You really had thought she ought to be dead. Come on. What what part of that was all like, and then she went and hung out with McCavity? No. <laughs> I'm rewriting the musical <laughs> very poorly. <laughs> Turning it into my own Jesus Christ Superstar now. It's not... She didn't need... Just like we don't need a romance, we didn't need a justification for why all the cats hate Grizabella. We know why. She's a dirty, homeless cat. No one wants to be around her. <laughs> Jesus. That's it. But I'm just being honest. Well, well, Nikki. <laughs> we all know why they don't like her. <laughs> Same reasons why I don't. She's dirty and homeless. Get some money and some class. Stop being poor. And me stop buying avocados. <laughs> hey, Grizabella. Oh, you sad nobody likes you? Well, have you tried stop being a piece of shit? <laughs> <laughs> You know, when back when Dream Girls came out, Jennifer Hudson, think about when that movie came out. Ugh. She was all anybody could talk yeah. about. And Beyonce is great. Like, that whole cast is great. And the only thing that anybody could talk about was five minutes in the end of the second act of the movie, and it's Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. And, I mean, that's the end of the story. That's That was, like, the big thing when it came out and how good she was in it. And that should have been the, her second time around with Cass. Yeah. It should have been Jennifer Hudson kills it once again. And instead, all we can talk about are buttholes not existing. Like, <laughs> that is crazy. Buttholes and continuity. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and it's a shame because she sings the hell out yeah. of that song, but it is shot so poorly and she looks so weird yeah. and not great that her voice gets sucked up in the confusion. Yeah. She, of every aspect of this movie, the minute she started to sing. Yeah. You could hear a pin drop. Like it is. Mm -hmm. I, even when I watched it for the second time, I stopped what I was doing. Like, I will say I wasn't paying as close attention to the movie the second time around, as soon as I was like, why are there human hands in this? I don't remember this. I hate this so much. I was like <laughs> trying to find anything to keep me busy so I wouldn't focus on how weird everybody looked. <laughs> she started to sing and it was just like, I can't stop staring yeah. at you. Right. Even with the snot and everything, I'm going to <laughs> look you square in the eye and you're going to give me feelings in my heart. Aww. When I saw it on Broadway with my mom, did we both cry? Um, what, what do you think? Of course, of course I, we both I cried. cried. Yeah, of course. That song just hits you in a way, and you have to have the right person to sing it. You have to right. have somebody who, I don't want to say somebody who has experienced pain should be the only person to be able to sing it, but you have to have someone who understands what that feels like mm -hmm. to, to be in that position that she is in. And I think Jennifer Hudson is a perfect person to sing that song. And when she sings it, it is just, it, you know, it brings a house down and to it have does, yeah. something so beautiful it's like a flower growing out of the crack in the sidewalk. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, <laughs> you're focusing on is that crack going to get worse instead of how beautiful is that flower? And right. that's what's a, that's probably the overall upsetting factor to cats is that we spent well over over our allotted time talking about how crappy this movie was and not enough time talking about this the beauty that was this song in this movie. I was just thinking how, you know, Grizabella is the, the cat that gets the chance for a second life in the stage show and how her character was written out of the Elliot book when they finally yeah. decided to produce it, or I'm sorry, publish it as this collection of poems that he had done. And then now she gets this second life after theater in the movie and she's destroyed once again. Yep. Once again, she gets like tossed out. It's upsetting. It's, it's it very upsetting. Um, speaking of the heavy side layer, the other cats who were not chosen, mm -hmm. are they still going to die? Yes. <laughs> I 
Yes. They I, all die. I knew you were going to say that. But I mean, like, <laughs> yes, I know that they all die. But I mean, like, we're told that cats have nine lives. And being brought up to the heavy side layer, be it by tire or by hot air balloon and chandelier. Um, <laughs> just so weird. Um, she, let's face it. It's probably a garbage <laughs> truck that she's just like being raised up into. Yeah. And she's going off to her death. Yeah. And she's being sacrificed so that the other cats can live on for another day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a dark, like it's always sunny ending would that be to the movie? If like the whole thing and then she's like getting, you know, she's, getting pulled up and then it just it's like a hard cut to somewhere in philadelphia and it's just like a garbage truck taking away the can and then that's oh. the end <laughs> womp 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 um <laughs> and it's like charlie like i wonder what those cats are meowing about <laughs> would watch this episode a hard watch um but do you think like all those other cats are definitely on the chopping block this is definitely like like a green mile situation for these cats. <laughs> <laughs> but when they all die, is that it? Are they cut off? Are they done? Or are they, or is there still a potential to be reborn? Just, or do you think that they, they get to reapply for next year? Are you asking me if there's an afterlife for cats? No. I don't know. I barely know about my no, life. No, I'm asking if like, okay, so they didn't get picked. So they're not dead this year. See you next year. <laughs> Like, do we, here's, do we think Gus the theater cat is going to make it another year to find out if he gets to be picked to go to the heavy side lair? No. So you think he's just going to die and that's it? He's gone? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what I wanted to know. Now I'm sad. I think, but I think this I is like, what, what's it called in um, Animal Farm that they tell the horse, it's like Big Big Rock Candy uh. Mountain or whatever, and it, it doesn't exist and it's just to make sure he keeps on working. I think just to make sure that cats keep singing, there's... Something else, but there, there's not. So technically, what you're saying is old Deuteronomy is <laughs> is like a a witch who sacrifices the cats of her tribe so that she can keep living because they do <laughs> say that old Deuteronomy has lived many lives. That's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> We finally, it took us forever, but we finally cracked it, you guys. The storyline to cats. Old Deuteronomy, a very old witch, is using a lie to get all the other cats to sacrifice their friends so that she can keep on living into the new millennium. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Easy enough for me. I, you know what? More power to her. All hail Deuteronomy. <laughs> Well, I think our, our sexy cat time is over. Well, I got to ask you the age old question, which do you think is better, the book or the movie? This is not. Oh, my God. Wait, which movie? Can I pick? Can I pick? No, you cannot pick. Oh, why? That is not that is not the subject matter of this podcast your birthday is over next year if you want for your birthday to be a bonus round where we do that movie that's fine but it is not today's discussion <laughs> i don't think my husband will let me do this again <laughs> stage show night like 2019 version the so listening to the soundtrack in a car i don't think he will allow any of it ever I was listening to the soundtrack today as I was putting on my makeup. Jellicle songs with jellicle cats. Oh. <laughs> it is a fun, it is a fun soundtrack. Um, no, this is not a direct. I do not believe this is a direct page to screen adaptation. So I would say that the book is better than the 2019 movie. I want to be clear. I'm not talking about the stage show, and I'm not talking about the filmed version of the stage show. The 2019 movie, I will go on record right now, is trash. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> no, yeah, the book is much better. The movie is not a good movie. Um, it, it is honestly one of the worst movies ever made. Yeah. And when you talk about bad movies, like, there's so many bad movies that I think are fun to watch. Because I think that when they were making them, there like there was one, 
it was the first like hammer Japanese movie and it was like really cool and the thing about it was that they really believed in what they were making yeah and so with this like they're there's no understanding of what's being made. There's no, like, heart to it. Yeah. That's the thing. It, it, the whole thing, it's flat. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm upset, but I'm glad we did this. <laughs> Me too, of course. And I, where stuff like this is fun is that I had expectations, but no understanding of what the original source material would be like. So yeah. I'm always like very curious when that happens. And, um, this was a lot like, <laughs> really? I, I, I actually enjoyed the poems and yeah. I did not expect that. And then having that in comparison to the stage show in a way makes me actually like the stage show a little bit more, but um the book not so much yeah I mean the the movie not so much this is and see that makes me happy because I've I've loved the poems um I have multiple times have said to Jesse that I want to get one of the cats that um from my copy I have the copy that's uh the Edward Gorey drawings of cats and I want to get one of them as a tattoo just because they're so stinking cute Aww. Maybe old Deuteronomy. He's just laying down. He looks really lazy. That's me. Um, <laughs> that's going to be me when we're done recording. Um, <laughs> it's It makes me happy to know that the the poems were something that you really liked. This is, it's just, they're fun. And they're that's fun. what makes the yeah. stage show so good. And that's, once again, what made the movie feel so clunky is it didn't seem fun. No. It doesn't. Yeah. It does not. Everyone knows Christina and I, we love the, we love the music to Cats, the musical. Mm -hmm. We're being very, we have to be very deliberate about this. <laughs> yes. We love Cats and, I love Cats the musical. We like the music to Cats the musical. Um, but this movie, ugh. so <laughs> based on that, because it, the book ranking is, is really like, would we read this book again? Would we watch this movie again? And is it a direct adaptation? Correct. Um, so putting all of that into perspective, we have the new list for you. Our golden child, All Hail Rosemary's Baby is first. <laughs> um, followed by Wizard of Oz, High Fidelity, Emma, Hell House, Waiting to Exhale, Jaws, A Night to Remember, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, The Birds, Forrest Gump, Born on the Fourth of July, Valley of the Dolls, Mommy Dearest, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, Ready Player One, and She Who Must Not Be Named. Yes. And I think that's a good spot for it. I stand by my vote. <laughs> yes. Since we're now in September, and we are starting our new season, <gasps> I know this was the last episode of the first season. Our one year Aww. anniversary. Aww. Oh. Christina, it's been so good doing this. Like, I know we talked about this at the beginning, but it has been so much fun. And the books that we've read that are technically considered our first season have been insane. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't imagine doing this with anybody else. Ah, no, it's it's really been nice. And the thing that um, is nice about you and I, we're best friends. We've been best friends for a long time. Yeah. But you and I have so many overlapping um, interests that it's easy to agree on something. However, we also are both very different. So we might bring yeah. different movies and books to the table that the other one would not prioritize, yeah. although they might be interested. So I think that that is very fun and it is a nice way to almost go back to where we met in high school and do a lot of research and work watching movies and reading books. And it's just, it's a yeah. good time. I enjoy it. Yeah. I think, I think that we, we meshed well together <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to, to steal a line from Clueless. Um, <laughs> no, this has been... This, this has been like a real joy and I know that Aww. Jesse has learned so much about our friendship <laughs> editing this <laughs> podcast. Um, oh my goodness, we've done so much in the last year and we are just going to keep the train rolling 
into season two um, and we're kicking it off with something I've never read, but I have watched. Christina, have you read this? No. No. This is going to be a real interesting one. We're doing Jumanji. Yay! I can hear the drums now. (laughs) That was Jesse on the drums, everybody, if you heard that. Um, And you know, I don't don't think my husband Carlos has watched this. (gasps) Stop it. Really? I know. Uh, Yeah, I don't think so. There are a few movies from my childhood that he has not watched, and I think this is one of them, and another one is uh, Edward Scissorhands. (gasps) Stop yeah. it. Okay, we're fixing this for him. We're fixing. I know. Yeah, one will be fixed this week. Yeah, it's yeah. it's just like I don't know. When I think about Jumanji, I think about my childhood. Yeah, same. I clearly remember the Friday night that we went to Target and bought the Jumanji board game. Me and my Aww. family, and we played it. We used to do board games all the time, and we played it, and it had a little card same. reader thing. Oh my goodness! Yeah. I am so excited to go. I'm I'm so excited to go back, you know. You know what? In mm-hmm. the jungle I must wait till I roll a five or eight, right? So I'll be waiting, you guys. No, yeah, this is gonna be awesome. Oh, uh, it has and you know what? I think it's a really good transition into fall. I agree. Yeah. There are a lot yeah. of there's there's a lot of fall foliage in that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's just going to be, I, if you guys thought this episode was fun, you wait till we start talking about our childhoods with Jumanji. This has been such a fun year, and I'm so excited to see what we do in the next year. Me too. I It's going to be a blast. And really, I'm so excited. Like, I can't even, I wish we were in person right now. I want to hug mm-hmm. you. Aw, I want to hug you. Oh, air hug. We're both vaccinated. It's good. Yeah. And who knows? You know, next year is, we're already plotting some stuff out for season two. And who knows? There could be a surprise in person episode. Oof. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. We are vaxxed. We might bring back the cat ears for it. I'm not sure. Lady, I'm gonna wear these every episode from now on. <laughs> I'm gonna pull a Tiffany Haddish. I paid for these. I'm wearing them. <laughs> Never you forget where you came from. <laughs> no. Well, Christina, this is forever going to be one of my favorite memories. Oh Mem- I'm not even gonna do it. Not even gonna do it. <laughs> started stopped this is where i this is where it ends <laughs> but christina cheers to you on our one cheers year. to you yes thank you may you always sit on a park bench with me i will always sit on a park bench and talk to you <laughs> <laughs> and once again thank you for jesse's year-long service thank you jesse <laughs> And thank you to all the listeners, yeah. people who kept listening since the, um, you know, the first episode. There's some that have been listening since day one, which is awesome. Yeah. New people, new people who maybe haven't even shown up yet. We are welcoming and we thank you. Yeah. We, we are just excited that ev- for everyone to join us on this because we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it took a year, but I admitted it. I don't know what we're doing. Um, we know now, we know more now than we did then and we will only learn more. So that is progress. Yeah. We are a carousel of progress. (laughs) I was trying so hard not to make a carousel of progress joke. I ruined it. (laughs) But yeah, thank you everyone. Don't forget to, you know, rate, review, subscribe. It's been a blast doing this for a year and we'll see how many more we got listen if hollywood just keeps taking ideas from books we're still gonna be here (laughs) till the day we die (laughs) boom (laughs) we'll even come back as ghosts it worked it worked in a christmas carol yeah (laughs) but until next time christina 